Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is In the News with Stephen. Thanks, Don. In the News for August 2020. The ACT. The Planck Space Observatory looked at the cosmic microwave background radiation until 2013, and it is still currently considered the most accurate such observatory and data set. From it, one can compute the expansion rate of the universe and therefore the age of the universe. While pre-digital TV can pick up some of the cosmic radiation as noise, much of the microwave radiation is blocked by water in Earth's atmosphere. And that's why the Planck Observatory was in space. In 2019, a research team measuring the movements of galaxies calculated that the universe is hundreds of millions of years younger than the Planck team predicted. That discrepancy suggested that a new model for the universe might be needed, or that one of the sets of measurements might be incorrect. The Atacama Cosmology Telescope ACT, in Chile, is also a cosmic microwave background observatory. The Atacama Desert has two features. One, it's one of the driest places on Earth, and it's also very high. The ACT stands at 17,030 feet of altitude, so there's less atmosphere to look through. The ACT has been operational since 2007. The detectors are cooled to a third of a degree above absolute zero. A team of scientists from 41 institutions in seven countries has used the ACT to generate a new estimate for the age of the universe. The new estimate agrees with the Planck value. This gives better confidence in the larger Planck data sets. The new estimate for the Hubble constant is 67.6 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and this is in agreement with the Planck estimate of 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The value from the measurement of galaxies is 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. It's quite a bit different. Scientists continue to look for signs of unknown physics or experimental errors of many kinds. That's how science advances. Black hole. 300 million light years away is a galaxy with a supermassive black hole. But two years ago, the bright corona, the ball of white light above the black hole on the left image, faded by a factor of 10,000. For astronomy fans, that's 10 magnitudes, the difference between looking at a medium bright star like Polaris and the full moon. Also in the left panel, a streak of something falls toward the accretion disk. In the right panel, some of the accretion disk has been dispersed. It's shown dark, causing the corona, the ball of white light above the black hole, to disappear. The whole object is now much dimmer. The dimming event took about 40 days. This phenomena has never been seen before, so it's a bit of a puzzle. We expect to see brightness changes like this on timescales of thousands to millions of years. Um, but over the next year after this event, the brightness nearly entirely was restored as the corona rebuilt itself. In March of 2018, an outburst was detected by ASAN, the All-Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae. That got researchers' attention. Lots of other telescopes in X-rays, optical, and ultraviolet were pointed at it. Some observ observations were for a whole day and some every six, every six months. NASA's NICER X-ray telescope on the International Space Station was used for daily data. The corona is thought to form due to magnetic fields in the accretion disk near the black hole. Magnetic field lines twist and break and reconnect, and they send energy out in both directions along the spin axis. 
And that's what is thought that happened. What is, <laughs> what is thought that happened is that a star crashed into the accretion disk as it was pulled apart by the black hole's gravity. This could cause the brief flash in brightness that ASAN detected. This could also have caused much of the accretion material to fall directly into the black hole and therefore out of sight. And the disruption could have largely eliminated magnetic fields that support the corona. If the star came close enough to the black hole, it would be consumed by the black hole. If that's the case, then the radius is also where the corona must be supported from. So we have a good idea where the star would have crashed into, and that gives us where uh, the corona gets formed from. And that's the black hole. Galaxy evolution. Astronomers have known that some galaxies have mostly old red stars and form very few new stars. The phrase is red and dead. Galaxies form, forming new stars are more blue due to the presence of young blue stars. In between is the transition zone, known as the Green Valley. For odd reasons, there aren't any green stars. Astronomers have talked about a process called quenching, but there isn't a consensus model as yet. The main idea is that the galaxy's central black hole is involved like a parasite that grows to consume the host galaxy. Not completely, but it, it does, uh, it does uh, something interesting. The way quenching is expected to work is that as the black hole grows, it heats up and disrupts the galaxy's gas supply, reducing or preventing star formation. Astronomer Sandra Faber of the UC Santa Cruz University of California, Santa Cruz, has proposed a new model. The idea is that small, dense galaxies differ from larger, diffuse galaxies. Dense galaxies have a larger black hole, uh, have larger black holes for their mass. Uh, large black holes uh, quench these galaxies sooner. Diffuse galaxies have smaller black holes, and the mass uh, has to grow much more uh, before strong quenching begins. Additionally, the growth rate of the black hole increases when a galaxy starts the Green Valley stage. The Milky Way is, right now, at that crucial point. The black hole is predicted to grow by another factor of three before full quenching in this galaxy. In the image, representative galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey are used to illustrate these dense and diffuse uh, galaxy evolution paths with higher galaxy mass to the right and higher black hole mass going up. Ingenuity. The Mars rover Perseverance is scheduled to launch on July 30th, 2020. Hopefully that's in the past. Landing on Mars February 19th of 2021. It carries a technology demonstrator, the Mars helicopter called Ingenuity. It is dropped on Mars before the, ro the rover goes anywhere. And then it's on its own. Two carbon fiber rotors spin in opposite directions at 2,000 to 3,000 RPM. That's 33 to 50 rotations per second. You'd hear it whine on Earth. It's a solar cell and battery power uh, system. It carries cameras to explore Mars or scout driving routes for perseverance. It's expected to fly no more than three minutes a day, and it's expected to fly up to five times over a 30-day period. Flights will show increasing capability. The first flight is to fly up three meters, hover, and then land. Horizontal flight 
over the mission will be a few meters per second, which is a few miles per hour. It's about two miles per hour per meter per second, something like that. A long flight might be 70 meters or yards and back. Flight on Mars can be hard because the atmosphere is about 1% as, de as dense as it is on Earth. So ingenuity is about four pounds. Nights at the Jezero crater, where they're landing, are expected to go down to minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus 90 degrees C. Also, the helicopter must fly on its own due to communications delays for interplanetary distances. Flights are planned from Earth with instru instructions sent to Ingenuity. NASA is now targeting October 31st, 2021 for the launch of the agency's James Webb Space Telescope from French Guiana. This is a delay from March 2021 due to the pandemic issues. The 6.5-meter six, 6 telescope is built from 18 hexagonal segments. The entire structure folds into a 5-meter fairing on the Ariane 5 launcher, shown on the right of the image. The launch brings it to the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange stable point, about a million miles farther out from the Sun and in line with the Earth. The bottom of the spacecraft points toward the sun throughout the entire mission, where a five-layer sun shield keeps the spacecraft cool, actually to under 50 degrees Kelvin, 50 degrees C above absolute zero. It should be noted that an active closed cycle cryocooler is also used for the mid-infrared instrument. The spacecraft is powered by solar cells. This side also faces the Earth all the time, so communications also re resides here. The top view, the top points away from the sun so that the cooled telescope can image the skies in uh, infrared. And that's the James Webb. And now a break for term of the month. Thanks, Stephen. The International Astronomical Union, or IAU, is a recognized authority for naming comets. When a comet is discovered and confirmed, the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams announces a discovery on behalf of the IAU. It is then given a designation according to the following pattern, a prefix alluding to the type of comet which can be any of the following. P for a periodic comet, C for a non-periodic comet, X for a comet that a meaningful orbit can't be computed, D for a periodic comet that no longer exists or is deemed to have disappeared, or I for a comet originating from interstellar space. After the prefix letter is the year of discovery, followed by an uppercase letter identifying the half month of observation during that year. A for the first half of January, B for the second half of January, C for the first half of February, and so on. Then after the letter comes a number representing the order of discoveries for that month, as in our example classified as, a, as not periodic, discovered in 2020 during the second half of March, and the third comet discovered in that half of March. So we have its designation as C2020F3. To complete the designation, a comet is given the name of its two first discoverers by last names for individuals, or a one-word acronym for a sky survey team of astronomers. In our comet's case, the discoverer being a team with a near-Earth object wide field 
infrared survey explorer or Neowise. Now if you haven't seen this comet yet, you better get out there quick because if you miss it this time, it's going to be, it won't be back for 6,800 years. And now back to Steve with more in the news. Images from ESA, NASA's Solar Orbiter, which was launched February 9th of 2020, the spacecraft made its first close pass to the sun, about 48 million miles from the sun, about half the distance from the Earth. Images illuminate the sun's atmospheric layers, which is important for understanding space weather. Three of the six imaging instruments, and one non-imaging, instruments are featured. There are 10 instruments on board. In this image, white arrows point to campfires, they call them, on the sun. These are mini flares, perhaps a millionth or a billionth of the size of the solar flares that one can see in a backyard solar scope. They're small, but they are everywhere you look. They may be important for the heating of the sun's outer atmosphere to 300 times the temperature of the solar surface. This is from the extreme ultraviolet imager, the EUI instrument on the solar orbiter. The solar and heliospheric imager, uh, its first image, shows a bright dot at the bottom uh, of the top left panel, which is Mercury. The bloom on the right side and extending into the middle is the zodiacal light, sunlight reflecting off of dust in the solar system. The bright bar on the right is reflecting off of an internal baffle, but illuminated by solar panels on the spacecraft. The sun is in the middle, and its brightness has been reduced by a factor of a trillion. Three pairs of images display the full face of the sun and a close-up of that type from the polarimetric and helioseismic imager, the PHI, combined these allow investigation deeper into the sun with helioseismology. The first is a measurement of the continuum intensity in visible light. So visible light, the brightness, more or less. The second shows the magnetic vector field, which comes from the polarization of the light. The third shows the line of sight velocity uh, blue for approaching and red for receding in this image. The solar orbiter will slowly tilt its orbit to 20, 24 degrees of incline from the ecliptic, and this will allow generation of data from the sun's poles. The full science orbit is expected around July of 2023 using gravity assists from Venus and the Earth. Closest approach to the Sun is closer than Mercury's closest approach. Finally, the Solar Wind Analyzer, which measured heavy ions of carbon, oxygen, silicon, and iron from the inner heliosphere, is also highlighted, so the data is pretty cool. TRAPPIST-1 Planet Atmospheres the TRAPPIST-1 star is an M dwarf. It's 84 times the mass of Jupiter, though only slightly larger in diameter. It's a single star system. The metallicity is 109% of that that the Sun has. It's thought that to be between 5.4 and 9.8 billion years old, so a bit older than the Sun, at least. The lifespan may be 12 trillion years for this M dwarf. There are seven known planets that orbit it, 
and they range from 77% to 115% of the diameter of Earth. So they're very much Earth-sized. And the surface gravity of these seven planets range from 50% to 100% of the Earth's surface gravity. Potentially, they could all have a surface temperature that allows liquid water. That's the habitable zone. These planets orbit the star in anywhere from 1.5 days to 18.8 days. The whole system is only 40 light years away. Could any or all of these planets have life on them? No artificial signals have been yet detected from the system. Observations with the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer, the Very Large Telescope, uh, and so on, were recently reviewed, as well as three-dimensional numeric climate models. The results are encouraging. Most of the TRAPPIST-1 planets have cloud-free, low-molecular-weight atmospheres, similar to what Earth's primordial atmosphere was like. They are unlikely to have hydrogen-dominated atmospheres. The data suggest that any TRAPPIST-1 planet atmosphere is most likely to be carbon dioxide, oxygen, or water dominated. Those that have atmospheres are likely to be favorable to life as we know it. That means that carbon dioxide, an essential climate stabilizer necessary for photosynthetic organisms, oxygen gas, nitrogen, and volatile elements like water exist. It also includes cloud cover, which is not only an indication of water, but provides protection against stellar radiation. Now, the data does not say with confidence that any of these TRAPPIST-1 planets have atmospheres with all of these elements, but rather places constraints as to what any atmospheres that do exist are made of. Finding out if any of the exoplanets in this system are habitable will have to wait for next generation telescopes such as the James Webb Space Telescope launching next year and infrared ground-based spectrographs that are able to detect heavy molecules like carbon dioxide, oxygen, methane, etc which are expected to be online over this decade. We hope that you enjoyed In the News for August 2020. And now we pass to Don for What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Stephen, for bringing us up to date with What's in the News. And now, What's Up in the Night Sky for August 2020. We'll begin with the sun. On August 1st, it rises at 6.25 a.m. and sets at 8.50 p.m. On the 31st, it rises at 6.56 a.m., setting at 8.06 p.m. The days are getting shorter as we reach the height of summer. The moon will be full on the 3rd, at last quarter on the 11th, it will reach its new phase on the 18th and be at first quarter on the 25th. It's an apogee furthest from the Earth on the 9th at a distance of 251,444 miles and at perigee, its closest approach to the Earth on the 21st when it will be 225,876 miles away, a difference of 25,000 568 miles. Next, the planet report. We'll begin with the biggest gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. On the first, both can be found about 20 degrees above the southeastern horizon, an hour after sunset in the constellation of Sagittarius. By the 31st, they're nearly due south, again, an hour after sunset. Jupiter is the brighter of the two at minus 2.7 magnitude, while Saturn, which is eight degrees to Jupiter's left, 
shines at 0 0.1 magnitude. August brings continued good viewing of both through a telescope. Remember to look for the largest moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto for Jupiter, and Titan for Saturn, which will be north of the ringed planet on the 1st and 17th, and south on the 9th and 25th. Jupiter can still be found in Aquarius, rising just past 10 p.m. on the 1st. By the 31st, it rises at sunset. Shining at magnitude 7.8, you'll need a pair of binoculars to see it, but only a telescope will show it as a 2.4 arc second wide bluish disk. Mars will brighten as the month progresses, starting out on the 1st at minus 1.1 magnitude and ending the month at minus 1.8 in the constellation of Pisces. August marks the beginning of the peak of Mars's viewing season, which runs through mid-December. Uranus continues to reside in the constellation of Aries the Ram, rising after midnight on the 1st, but by the end of the month, it will be well-placed at a more convenient hour, or binocular viewing, shining at magnitude 5.8. A telescope will show a greenish blue disk covering 3.6 arc seconds. Venus will be in its, quote, morning star mode, unquote, during August, shining on the 1st at magnitude minus 4.5, near the star that marks the tip of the southern horn of Taurus the bull. As the month continues, it moves past Orion and into Gemini. On the 15th, it will be four degrees south of the waning crescent moon. Mercury makes a brief appearance in the morning sky prior to its superior conjunction on the 17th. It reappears in the evening sky late in the month. The Perseid meteor shower reaches its peak on the night of the 11th into the early morning before dawn on the 12th, though they can be viewed until the 24th, but with declining numbers per hour. The best time to view a meteor shower is from midnight until dawn. This is one of the biggest showers of the year. And while it's possible that up to 100 meteors per hour could occur, expect to see a range of between 50 to 75 per hour, weather conditions permitting. Meteor showers happen when Earth passes through a debris trail left by a comet. This shower results from particles from Comet Swift-Tuttle, which last went by in 1992. And that's what's up in the night sky for August 2020. Uh, please subscribe and click the bell on our YouTube channel, Astronomy for Everyone, to receive notifications of the live broadcast of the Perseid meteor shower, weather permitting, of course. Thanks for watching.